Okay, so one o'clock is upon us, folks, and we've got plenty to get through, so please let us uh, get kicked off. You're all very welcome. Great to see you all along um, from near and far. I can see someone in from Dubai, someone from India, someone from the Netherlands. Great to have you all with us. Um, our topic for the next 45 minutes is the psychology of UX, and we're going to dig in and think about the relationship and the interface between humans and computers um, and how we can think about that and manage that when it comes to design. The team that we have today um, are two folks from Fathom. I'm one half of the team, I'm Garth, and I'm the CEO at, at Fathom. And with me today, I am very capably assisted by Emma. Yeah, hi, I'm Emma. Um, I'm a UX researcher at Fathom. Um, and yeah, my, my, uh, you, can, you can follow me on Twitter at, at LDogo. And similarly, I'm at uh, Dunlop71. So please feel free to, to follow us um, and, and follow up on Twitter if that's of, of most value. So what are we up to for the next uh, period of time? Well, um, we're going to think about uh, the psychology of, of UX. And you can see the uh, subjects that we've got uh, lined up. Um, sections two and three are to do with UX's roots in human-computer interface and thinking fast and slow. So in a sense, Sections two and three are about teeing up the subject, introducing what it means and how it impacts design. And then sections four, five, and six are to do with what we do about it. So, so if we have persuaded you by the time we get to the end of section three about some of the dynamics that we're going to share, then items four, five, and six are about how we think about design and how we do design to make sure that we are sensitive and aware of um, the psychology of UX and the psychology of, of interaction design. As before, we want to get through our material um, at the right pace, we want to keep things moving because we do want to make sure that there is a good 15 minutes for, for Q&A at the end. Um, I think the big learning for us at Fathom over the last uh, number of webinars has been that the Q&A has been really lively and the questions have been excellent. So please, please, please ask as many questions as you want uh, along the way. It's unlikely we'll get them all answered, but we'll answer as many as, it, many as we can on the webinar. As well as that, what we've been doing is for the questions that we haven't got answered on the call, we follow up with a Q&A transcript, which we put onto the Fathom blog. And again, for those of you who maybe uh, missed previous webinars or didn't get to the Q&A, I would encourage you to go to the Fathom blog where you'll see recordings of the previous video and you'll see our Q&A. Okay, so that's enough preamble. Let's get on with the uh, show and let's begin to think about the topic um, at hand. So the first thing that we wanna think about is we want to begin to think about um, human computer interaction. Um, and kind of bring this into the, the mix. Now, what we mean when we talk about human-computer interaction is that we are thinking about the human factors which influence how humans engage with computers. And long before the term UX was even described or before it became ubiquitous or before it became mainstream, um, computer technicians and computer scientists were talking about human-computer interaction. And, and what human-computer interaction refers to is the interface between the perfectly logical, perfectly rational computer and the often illogical, often irrational, sometimes tired, sometimes irritable, often impatient, often distracted human. And what human computer interaction is about is asking the question, how should what we understand about humans influence how we think about computers? Let me give you a couple of really um, simple examples. When I'm watching iPlayer um, in the evening and I'm watching a show on BBC or I'm watching a show on Netflix and I want to make myself a cup of tea or I need to go to the loo, I press pause and I go and make my cup of tea and I come back into the room. And when I press play, Netflix or iPlayer doesn't start me where I left off. It starts me 15 seconds before where I left off. Why? Because it knows that from a human factors perspective, I like to be eased back into where I was. So there's a lovely example where if we were completely rational beings and humans and computers were exactly the same, BBC iPlayer would just start me where it stopped me previously. But the human factor element says we can soften this experience by thinking about how a human works and change the completely logical, rational computer experience to match the illogical human. So that's what we're getting at when we talk about humans and, and computers. We're exploring this idea of how can we humanize, how can we soften, how can we empathize design um, to make it more relevant and more helpful for, for humans. Um, this guy on the screen here is a guy called Leo Chern. Leo Chern was one of the first guys to think about how computers 
impacted society at a national level. In the 1960s and the 1970s, when it was far less obvious than it is today that humans were going to have, sorry, that computers were going to have a big impact on society, he was one of the first guys who encouraged national governments to take technology serious, seriously at a national level. And as you can see here, he was uh, president of the, he was chair of the president's intelligence advisory board in the 1970s. So he would have advised guys like Jimmy Carter, um, like Ronald Reagan and so on, helping them understand how technology and society um, intersect. But he has, this, he has this lovely observation for me, which I think starts to get to the truth of the potential when you get the best of technology and the best of, of humans. He says this, the computer is incredibly fast, accurate and stupid. Man is incredibly slow, inaccurate and brilliant. The marriage of the two is a force beyond calculation. And what he's starting to get at here is he's really encour encouraging us to think about just how differently wired humans and computers are. So if we think about some of the characteristics that you might use to describe a computer, we might say that it's fast, it's logical, it's literal, it's sequential, it's amoral, it's dumb. But when we think about humans, we might say that we are error prone and irrational and emotional, but we have the capacity for brilliance. We have the capacity for creativity. We have the capacity for imagination. Lots of things that, that computers just don't have. And what um, HCI and UX psychology is encouraging us to think about is, can we design in a way that allows humans to, to thrive, that mitigates against some of the worst characteristics of the human brain? It's slow, it's irrational, it's emotional but allows the best characteristics of the human brain to thrive. It's creative, it can imagine a world that doesn't exist, it is innovative, and so on. So that's what we're getting at when we talk about the psychology of UX. So let's explore two sides of the same coin, and let's think about a couple of examples of recognition and recall, which illustrate what we're trying to get at here. And again, for the purposes of um, Today, I'll just kind of define what I mean by recognition and recall because they mean slightly different things in the context of UX. Recognition is when something barely touches your brain and you're entirely up to speed. So you come home from work and you see your partner and your kids who you saw that morning and you, you recognize them straight away. Contrast that with meeting an old school friend who, who you haven't seen in 30 years. Your brain has to work much harder to find that person, to place that person, to remember the old stories. And you have to kind of dig into your archives, if you like, to, to work that out. So let's think of a couple of examples. Imagine you uh, go for a stroll at lunchtime and you bump into an old school friend who you haven't seen in 10, 20, 30 years. And you recognize this person and you, you have a conversation. Ah, Dave, how are you? Haven't seen you in 30 years. How's the form? Um, and, you'll, you know, do you have any family and what are you doing with yourself now and all that sort of stuff. And depending on how well you know Dave, you might ask him or you might recollect an old memory. You might remember a game of football you played together or a night out you had or a mountain that you climbed and you do a bit of reminiscing. Now, there is an example of recognition and recall where it's very natural for humans to recognize their old friend Dave and to have that conversation. My computer is decades away from having that kind of interaction. And even if it could, I'm not convinced my old mate Dave wants to have that interaction. But contrast that with another uh, recognition and recall an example. Let's say you said to me, Garth, give me the name, number, and email address of the 10 people in the world that you are closest to. Now, as it turns out, I, I couldn't do that. Um, I promise you it's not because I am an unfeeling pig or anything like that. The reason that I couldn't is because I don't have a great memory. I could give you three or four mobile numbers. I could give you five or six email addresses, but that would be it. But you could ask my iPhone the same question and it would give them to you in a nanosecond. In fact, you could ask my iPhone for a hundred of those or a, or a thousand or 10,000 or a million. And my iPhone could go all day long and give you as much information as you wanted. And the reason that I share those two stories is what I'm getting at here is that at the surface, humans and computers appear to be similar. We both have processing capability and we both have memories. But when you dig below the surface, what you begin to quickly realize is that actually we are wired in a very, very different way. And this psychological principle has to influence how we do design. It has to influence how we understand our job. And it has to, make, it has to have some kind of impact in terms of how we make design decisions when we are thinking of humanizing or empathizing um, or crossing the bridge in, in design between the human and the computer.
And maybe you've heard phrases like the best interface is no interface. Or you've heard phrases like the highest compliment that you can pay an interface is that the user didn't notice it. The reason that we say things like that is specifically for the, based on the concepts that we have just shared. It's because they are so different. And when an interface isn't noticed, what it means is that it is human-like. It is empathetic. It is soft. It is aware of the human brain and has been designed around it. So that's a little bit of a warm up in terms of human computer interaction. Um, and I'll hand over to Emma now, who's going to um, dig a little bit deeper into this and she's going to introduce us to thinking fast and slow. Thanks, Gareth. Um, yeah, so um, I'm going to talk a little bit about system one and two. Um, it's a framework set out in Daniel Kahneman's book, uh, Thinking Fast and Thinking Slow. Um, so um, System one and system two, two can be think, thought of as two distinct systems. Um, system one works automatically and quickly with little or no effort. It's intuitive and it relies on um, mental shortcuts and our experiences of past events um, and biases to make our decisions. So, but system two, on the other hand, is used for those kind of mental activities that require um, uh, analytical thinking um, and um, things like solving sol solving um, complex mathematical equations. It's um, it's a slower system um, and it's um, used for learning. Um, and although it's much more reliable, we, we don't tend to engage in, engage with it um, as much as we should when we're making day to day decisions. Um, this is because system two is actually inherently lazy. Um, and if the information to make a decision seems to be available to system one, System two is quite happy to um, to sit back and, and, and remain idle. So um, so if if we are designing systems and interfaces that we want users to navigate through quickly, um, we we really as a rule of thumb we don't want to engage user system two unless we really need to. So um, Kahneman's um, definition of system one is closely related to the concept of intuitive design. Um, which, um, which generally, um, although there's no kind of um, agreed upon definition, it generally describes designs that are easy to use. Um, so in other words, um, things that we can understand um, and we can use almost immediately without having to consciously think about what we're doing and how we're doing it. Um, so when we design interfaces, we can build, um, to do this, we can build on users' experiences with the physical environment. So, um, you know, if we start experiencing and experimenting with the physical world from, from a very early age, um, and the, you know, it starts with things like the first time we, we hold, we have hold an object, we drop it on the floor, um, and the first time we learn how to crawl to something. We're developing our, on our basic sensory motor skills. Um, and the, 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 our experience with the physical world is so much a part of our everyday life that we take it for granted. So like children who've grown up in the digital age uh, with smartphones and iPads, I mean, they can pick up an iPad and intuitively know how to use it um, because they're appealing. They're small, lightweight, like a toy. Um, once toddlers adopt some of those easy to learn gestures, the pinching, the swiping, um, that they, they would use also in the physical world, um, they can quickly learn how to do useful things like play video games or buy things on Amazon. So, um, so that relates to the, um, to the idea of cognitive load. Um, intuitive design, um, or cognitive load, sorry, is the mental effort that is required to learn new information. Um, and in UX terms, uh, it really refers to the mental effort needed to use a product and interact with it. So um, to reduce cognitive load, we all need to draw um, on, we also need, to, in addition to the physical environment, we also need to draw on users' cultural experiences. This is because there's there's too many restrictions. Um, and I think Gareth has touched on these in the, you know, in the physical world. So it, it would be, it would really be impossible to navigate through our playlists on Spotify um, or on Apple iTunes the way we might browse through uh, vinyl in, in a record store in a record shop or find information in the same way that we do in the physical world where we browse through in encyclopedias or sift through documents and files. So uh, digital interfaces, they offer these users convenient shortcuts and this makes it worthwhile spending just a little bit of effort to learn how to use them. Um, and the key is just not to overload users um, and the amount of learning that they need to do. 
So some, some examples of components that we derive from cultural experience um, is the play icon, um, which it's widely understood um, um, you know, internationally and it's drawn from um, things like audio and TV equipment. Um, referring to search as Googling, um, I think that's something that's also widely understood. And even the, the icon of the magnifying glass is something that people generally identify with. Um, another example, the QWERTY keyboard. This is something that dates back from back to all the way back to 1872. Um, and it was used in the type of with typewriters. And it's something that um, is, is so familiar, but um, it's actually not that efficient. Um, and then uh, finally, the recycling bin or the trash I icon. Um, there's, you know, the icon of the of the of the trash um, uh, bin, but also the, the the metaphorical action of of putting something in the bin and removing it. So these kind of um, metaphors and icons they all tie in with um, the the concept of skeuomorphism. Um, and this refers to the idea of drawing on a well-known object from one domain or context and then placing it within another. Uh, and as you can see, obviously, there is also then this uh, overlap between cultural um, experiences and the physical environment. So, um, so when we're designing products, it's important to think about how we can draw on both of these domains um, to help users learn quickly how to interact with your product. Um, so. This is something that um, that Steve um, Krug um, talks about when he says that um, uh, in in the, the author of "Don't Make Me Think," he highlights this well when he says, um, "As a user, I should never have to devote a millisecond of thought to whether things are clickable or not." And um, also, then um, Jake's law of internet user experience states that users spend more time on other sites, and and really they prefer your site to work the same way. As all the other sites that they already know. So this can create a, a difficult balancing act. On the one hand, users will feel that a design is intuitive when it's based on principles from other domains that are well known to them. But then innovation, on the other hand, is how we kind of push things and um, we can change things and push the boundaries of design. So um, but if you're introducing people to new innovative patterns, it forces them to, into the system to mental processing, mental processing. So getting the right mix of innovation that's geared to system one uh, can only be achieved by having a, a, a thorough understanding of users. Um, and how we do this, how we build up this picture is by conducting in-depth user research and usability testing um, to get meaningful insights into the to the need, needs goals and motivating motivations of our users so i'll pass over back over to gareth now we'll take you through the prioritization okay thanks uh, emma so uh, emma has uh closed off um some of that thinking about the difference between the human brain and computers and she's introduced it, she's introduced us to system one and system two thinking and she has kindly begun to paint the picture in terms of the interface about some of the things that we need to pursue when we're designing an interface around familiarity and around um, ease of use and, and uh, cultural references um, and so on. That said, there are some other things that we can do in the design process which are wider than purely the interface itself, which help us introduce um, uh, soft psychological thinking into how we do design. Um, and to illustrate um, what, I'm, uh, what I mean, I'm gonna introduce you very briefly to the evolution of the telephone. And I'm going to start to think about how telephone designers have sought to preserve simplicity and familiarity and some of the things which uh, Emma has shared with us as telephones have become increasingly complex and have become increasingly full of, uh, of features. Um, and I don't necessarily want to comment specifically on how good or bad the telephone interfaces are. I simply want to think about some of the principles which have guided the evolution of the phone and think about how those might apply to us as designers as we think about getting that balance right, as Emma said, between familiarity and innovation, between what has come before and which guides our online behavior um, and introducing things which are, which are new. So when I was a kid growing up in the 1970s, the telephone in our house looked like uh, one of the three phones that you see on your screen right now. And when I was a kid, I remember my parents teaching me how to ride a bike. I remember my parents teaching me how to tie my laces but I don't recall my parents teaching me how to use the phone. Um, and the reason is simple. They didn't teach me how to use the phone. And the reason that they didn't teach me 
how to use the phone was because they didn't need to. This wasn't because I was some kind of child prodigy or a particularly gifted child. This was simply because the phone was designed in such a way that it was unbelievably easy to use. In other words, through the eyes of a child, simply by observing your parents and mimicking your parents, you could use the product. So I was passing the phone in the hall one day. Isn't it, isn't it quaint to think that our phones used to sit in the hall? I was passing the phone in the hall one day. The phone was ringing. I was passing it. I picked it up and I said, hello, and the rest is history. Now, the reason that that phone was so easy to use and the interface is so intuitive was because the 1970s phone only did two things. And it was brilliant at both of them. It allowed you to make a call or it allowed you to receive a call. So because it only did those two things, it was possible for the product designer to make the interface incredibly simple, straightforward, intuitive. All the things which Emma has talked about were all baked into the product because the product was only had two features. It only did two things. But of course, the 1970s came and went. And along came the 1980s and the 1990s and the beginning of phones that were wireless and the beginning of phones that were button controlled rather than dial controlled. And all of a sudden, some of the natural intuition which we had on the 1970s phone began to get compromised as we thought about these new phones. So for instance, you will see on both the phones on the screen, there are additional buttons. There's not just the numbers zero to nine, but there are three buttons along the bottom of the phone at the top and there's six along the bottom of the phone um, at the bottom and then there's another uh, five or six along the top. So what happens is the confidence with which we use the 1970s phone gets diluted as we move into the 1980s and the 1990s because there are additional um, buttons to manage the additional functions and features. Now the truth is that when you think about the functions and features which the 1980s and 90s phones brought us, there's only two or three more. It's to do with maybe voicemail or a simple address book or silent um, or um, uh, recording an answer phone. So there's only a couple of extra functions and features. But what you can see is that the interface is already um, exponentially growing in complexity. So with only a small number of new features, we are pushing an awful lot of additional cognitive load um, into the hands of the, of the user. And the confidence that I had as a kid in the 1970s all of a sudden isn't so good there because these new functions and features increase complexity. Let's fast forward another decade into the kind of the first phase of mobile phones and we see this exaggerated yet further. We now have phones that can't just do five or six things like the 1980s phones. We have phones now that can do maybe 20 things. It's got the core phone functionality, but we've got address books, um, not forgetting maybe the most important function on the Nokia at the bottom, the game Snake, can't forget that. So all of a sudden, there's lots of new things that this phone can do, and there's additional complexity. But I want to just take a moment and think about the sort of the noughties phones, kind of 2002 to 2012, the, the pre-smartphone phones. When you had phones, um, again, driven predominantly by Nokia, who were the market leader at the time, that were able to offer users 50 things, 50 features. And the question is, the, the challenge is, how does um, that phone um, how does that phone uh, um, uh, deal with all of those um, features? Here's how Nokia managed to dominate that market. Here's how they managed to bring the smartphone mainstream. Here's how they managed to do what smartphones, what Henry Ford did to the motor car, which is democratize it and make it affordable. Here's how they thought. They recognized that of the 50 things that their phones could do, in the 2000s. Of those 50 things, there was a small subset of functions and features which were of greatest value, that were of greatest familiarity, that were of greatest um, uh, consequence to the users who would be using it. And what they said was, we are going to prioritize those features. We are prepared to take the trade-off which says, in order to prioritize the features which most users use most often, we are prepared to demote features which only some users use some of the time and features which few users use small amounts of time as well. So what they said was, of these 50 functions and features, which are the ones that are most familiar? Which are the ones that are of greatest value? Which are the ones that will be used most frequently? And what they come up with was sending a text message, receiving a text message, making a call, receiving a call, managing your address book, and maybe, just maybe, playing Snake. 
So having identified those four, five, six things, which most users do most times, in today's parlance, we call those use cases. Having identified those use cases, they designed the product around those use cases. And what they said was, we're going to make sure that the interface on the product is dominated by the controls which run those use cases. So if you have a look at the three mobile phones that we've got on the screen there in section four, what you will see is that if you look at the hardware, the keyboard and the software piece, those are dominated by the controls that you use to make a call, receive a call, send a text, receive a text, manage your address book and possibly or not play snake. So when we think about how, we, how do we think about design, how do we prioritize, what decisions do we make in light of what Emma has just shared, the big lesson from Nokia is that if you want to reach mainstream, you got to be really focused on the things that most of your users want to do most of the time, and you must make sure that is the stuff which dominates the interface. Because if you don't do that, then what's going to happen is your product is going to try to be all things to all people, and in doing so, it will be nothing to anyone. So when we look at good design and we think about the, how good design thinks about psychology, they take really seriously the pursuit of simplicity. And they have, des they are, they have product designers who are prepared to have really difficult internal conversations to say to people, you're not getting that feature on the home screen. You're not getting that feature on the home page. That's not going to be a link in the menu. You're not getting it. Because in order to give that to you, we are diluting or diminishing the experience that we are giving the majority of our users in order to meet the needs of a small number of internal users. So maybe the single biggest impact of the psychology of UX when we think about how we um, uh, do, our, do our design is that we are tough. We, we know our users well enough to know the things that most users do most times, and we are ruthless in making sure that we design for them. I don't have time today to think about how Google do this. I'll give you a clue though. If you go onto the Google search page and Google have hundreds of products, you'll only see one thing, search. Why? Because Google knows that the vast majority of people who are on that page are there to search. Old school thinking, um, does non-design thinking would say, hey, there's a perfect place to advertise all of our other products. But design thinking in the psychology of UX says, you do that, you break that product, no one comes there anymore. So in pursuing the simplicity and the familiarity, which Emma had suggested, ruthless prioritization and the pursuit of simplicity is a, is a major aspect of getting that right. And what Nokia did in the 2000s laid the foundation to allow us um, to enjoy the smartphone revolution uh, in the 2010s. So that's what prioritization looks like. And in case you're, you're thinking through the logic of this and you're asking yourself, what would this have been like if Nokia hadn't taken this approach? Well, as it turns out, um, I have an answer. And the answer is that smartphones and mobile phones would have gone the same route of television remote controls. Because television remote controls also started life off really straightforwardly when technology was from a simpler time. Um, and this one you can see, volume goes up and down, channel goes up and down, and that's about it. But fast forward to today's um, uh, remote controls, and what you will see is just massive controls that are difficult to navigate, difficult to understand, they work, they work differently, and are dominated by controls that most of us never use. Most of us use about 10% of our television remote controls, and we have learned to use our remote controls not because of the interface, but rather in spite of the interface. So when we talk about familiarity and we talk about um, simplicity, these things are difficult. And the reason that UX professionals sometimes get a little bit precious when people infer that we are user interface only people, the reason that UX spans beyond the interface is that if you only think about experience or you only think about simplicity at the end, it is too late. You cannot sprinkle simplicity on at the end. You've got the whole complexity out right throughout the process. And in order to do that, you need, perfect, you need design professionals who are committed to making sure that you build a product around the greatest needs of the greatest numbers of users. The final thing which I'll mention just in, in closing off uh, this piece before we go on to uh, our Q&A is um, another really powerful way of getting the psychology of UX right and humanizing design is to pursue context. Probably the most famous quote in the context of this 
pardon the pun, comes from Theo Levitt, who was a Harvard Business School professional, uh, uh, professor in the 60s, uh, 70s and 80s. Um, and he had this simple observation. People don't want um, a quarter inch drill bit, they want a quarter inch hole. And what he was getting at is that very often when people engage with a product that we uh, have built or designed, they are using it to pursue something else. And what Levitt is getting at is that when we pursue what that something else is, it gives us a brilliant opportunity to ask good questions that help us humanize design. Every time we ask a question or we do a piece of research or we spend time with users which help us better understand their world, we give ourselves a better chance of humanizing design. Why? Because we have walked in their shoes, we understand their world, we know what they're trying to achieve, and that gives us the context that we are after. So, thanks for bearing with us. Um, folks, allow me to just summarize with our, with our five takeaways. Um, number one, humanize the interface and you humanize the experience. Humans and computers are remarkably different. Work hard to soften the experience that you're designing. Number two, as far as possible, let your users think fast. Let your users stay in system one thinking when they're using your um, product. Number three, and I borrowed this one from Luke W. Some of you may um, uh, know the, the, the Google product design guy. Obvious always wins. Um, no exceptions. I've been at this longer than I care to remember. I've never seen an exception. I don't think there is an exception. Uh, keep your interface simple, predictable, and familiar. Number four, be prepared to make hard decisions during product design. Do not take an easy ride internally because um, it will come to the detriment of your, of your product. Prioritize and commit to the critical trade-offs during the design process. Um, and finally, with the words of Theo Levitt in our ears, pursue context, work hard to put yourself in your user's shoes and to better understand their world. Okay, folks, thank you so much for, for bearing with us and, bear, and uh, uh, bearing with us through the uh, theory bit. Um, the, uh, the good news is that the questions are coming in and that we're going to get moving into those uh, straight away. Um, so my um, first uh, question, Emma, is uh, for you. Um, to give me a little uh, break. Um, and it's going back to this kind of simplicity and familiarity piece. Um, so the question is, uh, do we run the risk of crushing creativity or limiting creativity or innovation if we overcommit to simplicity and familiarity and so on? Uh, okay, <laughs> good question, Gareth. Um, no, I don't think so. I think, um, I think it, that almost... Um, uh, you know, sets the challenge that um, I think, you know, creativity is about problem solving. So I think, um, you know, the, the, the you know, the, the, the simplest um, designs are, 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 as we, as we see, um, you know, are, are the ones that are, are the best and, um, you know, the, 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 the best meet, you know, the, the user's user needs. Um, so I think creativity almost like, you know, lays down the gauntlet for people to, uh, to address, uh, you know, challenges more creatively. Yeah, great, Emma. I, I I would agree com completely. The um, the, the analogy that I sometimes use is uh, is a is a rugby analogy, and um, I, I go back to two rugby heroes of mine, um, Paul O'Connell and, and Brian O'Driscoll, and everybody you know rightly loved Brian O'Driscoll for his ability to to see a gap and to take on a player on the outside and to score wonderful tries in the corner. But the only reason he's able to score wonderful tries in the corner is because Paul O'Connell and the forwards have spent all week practicing lineouts and getting the basics right. And I, I do think that, we, that we, we think there's a bigger tension between basics and process and fundamentals and creativity than there actually is. I think they, I think they go hand in hand. Um, okay, another question has come in, which, which is actually one of my favorites, and I'll, so I'll, I'll maybe take this one myself. Um, so the question is, how, how do you suggest balancing use cases and universal accessibility? Um, so I'll say a couple of things. Uh, number one, whilst this presentation isn't about accessibility, we, we absolutely and without um, exception of any description, um, pursue and embrace and think accessibility is, is widely, it, it hugely important to the success of any um, digital product. Um, for a number of reasons, uh, it's the right thing to do. We should be designing for as many people as possible. Um, commercially, I don't know any organization who can afford to exclude 10 or 12 or 15% of their target audience. Why would you do that if you didn't um, have to? Um, and thirdly, we find that accessible products are easier to use. Everybody benefits from accessible products, not just people who need to use assistive or accessible um, devices. Um, but the broader question is a really important one. Um, 
around how do you balance use cases and universal accessibility? The, the answer is, um, if you don't prioritize during the design process, you make life worse for everybody. So it's like, it's like being in charge of a budget to build a road and the government says, you've got to go and build a motorway there. And um, you're trying to work out where you, where you build the motorway. If you don't build a motorway, and the analogy is if you don't identify your use cases or you don't identify your major flows through your product, if you don't build a motorway, you slow down all the traffic. And it's exactly the same in, in technology. If Nokia hadn't identified that the main motorways were making a call, receiving a call, sending a text, receiving a text, managing your address book, if they hadn't built those motorways, the result would be that they just slowed down all the traffic. Um, now, you might say, oh, that's not very fair, Garth, that you're, you're benefiting the people who want to make a call and you're, you're on benefiting, you're making life harder for the people who want to use the calendar or want to use the browser in the 2004 uh, Nokia phone. And I would agree with you, it's not fair, but it is more fair than the alternative. Because either you make life easy for the 80 to 90% of your customers who are going to be making a call or sending a text, um, either you make life easy for them and not everybody else, or you make life difficult for everybody. Um, and we see that in remote controls. Very few of us have remote controls that we would say that we like or that are intuitive. We, 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 we sort of develop a Stockholm syndrome with them where we get used to them um, over, over time. So there, there, is a, there is a balancing act in the sense that design is a craft and you can't just kind of wheel in easy answers. We never, we, none of us have that uh, benefit. But um, it's not as much of a balancing act as you might think it is because if we don't do it, we make the product worse for everybody. Um, okay, a um, couple more uh, questions. Emma, how would you feel if I was to send this question in your direction? What's the biggest mistake you see new designers making? Um, yeah, I think, um, yeah, I guess the, um, the, the thing that I would say, um, is that I guess when, whenever you leave college or, you know, start designing, it's, it's always, it's always nice to be able to, uh, show, you know, showcase your skills and showcase the best, um, of your, you know, designs and, um, visuals that you, you know, that, that you can do. Um, and that is always important to, tr to try and push that and, uh, experiment. But I, I feel sometimes, um, the, the going back to, you know, what is the problem that you want to solve? What are the ta user tasks that you, um, that you need to address, you know, sometimes that can be lost, um, in, in the, in the visuals and in the, the designs, because, you know, the, you know, I think Gareth mentioned that the processes haven't maybe been in place um, before that we got to the to the actual you know um, interface and the UI um, that um, we haven't looked and spent enough time you know kind of researching what are the needs the goals um, and the motivations of our users and really understanding what are those behaviours um, and that is the you know that is the key then to providing you know simple easy to use inf interfaces and then applying you know the design skills to solve solve those problems to make life easier for users so i hope that sort of goes some way to answering the question gareth yeah i i would agree i'd agree completely emma i think i think the easiest thing to do is to lose sight of the fact that our principal job as designers um, is to solve problems and and when we move away from that Every time we move away from that, we, we put ourselves in a, in a, in a dangerous place. Um, I, I maybe have a go at answering myself. I, I think the, the next thing that I would answer is, um, I think new designers forget that, that their boss, if you like, is, is the user. I think it's easy to forget that when you design something, the sole arbiter of its quality, the only person who is qualified to comment on whether or not your design is good is the user, is the person that you have designed it for. And sometimes I see conversations maybe on social media or I see conversations around Dribble, where people say, oh, lovely looking portfolio. Well, that's really beautiful. That's really nice. And whilst it's lovely to be complimented and it's lovely for design to be aesthetically pleasing, um, those, those comments don't matter. And the reason that they don't matter is because the people who've made the comments are not the target of the, of the design. Um, and I think the challenge you know, I would set myself and all designers is just to remember, you know, who, who, do, you, who do you work for? The, the only opinion that matters, the sole arbiter of the quality of your work 
um, is not your boss or your peers or awards judges or any of that sort of stuff. The sole arbiter of the quality of your work is the people who have to use your design. And it's just good to keep that as a focus. Um, okay, folks, I think we are in a, uh, oh, sorry, sorry, there's new, there's new questions here, which I haven't got a chance to vet. So um, uh, let me just uh, cover a couple of um, quick ones. Um, Emma, could I ask you this, of all the accessibility strands to address, e.g. visual impairment, cognitive motor difficulties, et cetera, what's the first one that you might uh, tackle? Is, is, there one, is there an order in which you tackle that sort of stuff? Um, oh, it's a good question. Um, like, I don't, I don't know if I would. Um, I would ensure, I suppose, if there's any functional um, issues that will, you know, I suppose, um, traps uh, would be one thing. I would say that anything that stops the user, you know, actually interacting with the system um, or, you know, with the, you know, to complete their tasks. If, if they can't do that and there are um, you know, barriers in their way, you know, those will be the key things to address. Um, but it's difficult to say which, you know, which ones are more important to address. Um, I guess, you know, you see, you think of impairments as a spectrum. Um, so it's, it's really just trying to build in as many um, uh, or trying to address as many of the checkpoints, you know, to, to enable as many people as possible to, to access, um, you know, the interfaces. So it's, um, yeah, I, I guess it's just, as I said, there are, you know, the barriers to actually completing a task or, or doing what you need to do. Okay, great. Uh, thanks, Emma. There's one, there's one final question, which I'll maybe tackle, tackle myself. Um, and it's, an, it's another great question. Um, if dealing with designing particular interfaces, how do we decide if we, sh if we should address it to specialist users who already know the basics of the workflow or new users who may be brought um, in by the simplicity of the, of the interface? Um, it's, it's a big topic, and so I'll, and I've got two minutes, so I'll answer it as, as quickly as I can. Um, in any situation where you are designing for a consumer or you are designing for the public, in other words, if you're designing anything for a bank or a utility or a telecoms um, or that kind of large organization who deals with citizens in general, you've got to pursue um, simplicity. In other words, it's easy to design for people who will use the digital interface anyway. It's easy to design for people whose default is to pick their smartphone out of their pocket um, and, and wish to interact with you that way. But if you want to get competitive advantage on others who are in that marketplace, or if you want to get beyond your easy to reach customers and get your harder to reach customers to become digital first, those harder to reach customers have to be front and center of your program of research and your program of iteration. You just don't have the luxury of designing for the expert or well-known user. Now, um, in the interest of balance, it's worth saying that there are definitely times where digital design does deal with expert users and you're building products for people who are using your product most days, maybe all day, every day, perhaps you're building something for the, for the workplace and that product is open on people's browsers for most of the day and these users do become expert over time. And in that case, it's absolutely appropriate that the expert user as well as the novice user become part of the, the testing program. So it does depend, but certainly if you're doing anything that's public, then we, then we would say make sure that a significant amount of your testing revolves around those harder to reach rather than easier to reach uh, users. Okay, so folks, time, time is up. Thank you again for your time and attention and for coming in and for your excellent uh, questions. As we've said before on previous webinars, do please stay in touch. Um, we'd love to hear from you on an ongoing uh, basis. You can subscribe to our email newsletter. You can follow us either um, at the Fathom Twitter account or myself and uh, Emma, you can see there. Our blog content is published on uh, LinkedIn and we'll send you a follow-up email uh, and we'd really encourage you to fill in the survey. As with previous webinars, this has been recorded. We're going to get it edited and up onto YouTube over the next couple of days. There are some questions that we didn't get a chance to answer, so we will also get those answered um, on the blog over the next couple of days as well. So please keep a close eye on uh, Twitter and on other channels. Um, and we'll be back for uh, the next webinar in our series um, in the next number of weeks. Um, but for now, um, thanks again, folks. It was great having you with us, and, uh, and thanks for your, your time. Thanks, everyone.